Hi, I'm Peter Tragos, host of the Lawyer You Know podcast and YouTube channel. The saying goes, everyone hates lawyers until you need one. Well, I'm here when you need one to answer your questions and give you insight that you didn't know you needed. Along with my partners, Pete Sardis, the professor, who has a finance and business background, and George Tragos, my dad, and the conciliary, a criminal defense giant, we can answer any questions you have. What's up, everybody? Today has been a wild day. I thought we were done with lives. I thought we were done with videos for the day. But then things happen. And Brian Laundrie's notebook has been made public, which is wild. And a lot of you asked, would this be made public? Will we ever know what he wrote? And the answer was maybe. I'm not really sure. We'll see what happens. The FBI has it. Uh, We knew that the... Um, FBI and the lawyers or the FBI was sharing some things and some belongings with the lawyers. And we know that they were going to split up. Some stuff was going to go with Gabby's family. Some stuff was going to go with Brian's family. And we have found the notebook. And before we get into what it says and whether it's true and how it'll affect the cases, um, go ahead and subscribe to the page and like this video if you're interested in this Petito and laundry content, because trying to keep track of what everybody's interested in, you know, what, what content to pour our time into. So when we talk about this notebook, there are a few questions. Is it real or fake? Is the story in the notebook true or false? How will this affect the motion to dismiss? How would this affect or be used in the, the case against his parents for intentional infliction of emotional distress? And how could this affect the wrongful death case? Because there are implications in all five of those situations. And the contents of the notebook are really sad. Um, Horribly sad situation. I have no idea to on how to explain whether it's true or false, right? It does kind of fall into line with some of the other evidence we have, what other people have said. The medical examiner's report, we'll talk about all of that. Is this a fake notebook? Okay, I see people saying the notebook is fake. If it was fake, it would be very easily provable by Gabby Petito's parents and their lawyer to prove that this is fake. They went to the FBI together. The FBI obviously um, had this notebook and turned it over. And they were there when they turned it over, right? It's not just one size being there. Or I'm sorry, one side being there. Um, Then if we take it to the next step about, about whether or not it's fake is when we get to it and we read what's in it, it sounds exactly like what law enforcement said. Brian Laundrie took responsibility for her death. They did not say he murdered her or anything like that. Um, And some may still think that it is, and we'll discuss what that would look like and what is actually admitted to in here. Uh, People are asking, was the notebook, um, was the notebook open to the public? The answer is yes. And we're about to go through it. I'm going to give people about another minute here to get on before we go through the notebook and I'll answer a couple questions. Looks like writing on your leg or knee, um, it wraps around. So that's people trying to say it's real. Was the notebook found at the same time as the body or after? I think it was right around the same time and it was in a bag. So you can tell it's kind of wet, but not totally wet. Melanie Casio said twice. Great way to end the week. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Thanks for coming on to discuss this so quickly. 77 MCL says... Um, people saying, I bet it's real. Who opened it to the public, Ray Ann? I'm glad you asked because I'm about to tell you. The story doesn't make sense, some people said. I don't know. I mean, this is actually one of the plausible explanations I talked about when we when we kind of heard what happened. Very sad. I, I don't know what's true or false, okay? So don't come at me with, how could you believe this? How could you report on this? Reports are, and it's been indicated to us that this is true. Now, whether we can believe the person reporting it to us, he is right in the middle of a lawsuit at this point as to whether or not what he says publicly is true. So I understand if you want to disagree with that, and that is fine. Um, Okay, without further ado, let's get to it. And the question was asked, where can you read the contents? Somebody asked, Cindy, right here. We're going to get into it. Um, But Rayanne asked the question, Who opened it to the public? And that's very interesting. Who would you think opened this to the public? 
both sides and their lawyers went and met with the FBI. The FBI showed them this notebook. They took pictures of this notebook on a paper, turned page by page to hear exactly what Brian Laundrie said, what his words are. We are going to get into that. Who do you think opened it to the public? People are saying his parents. Some people are saying Gabby's parents. Well, it was none other than Stephen Bertolino, the lawyer, the personal counsel for the laundry parents. He is the one that made this public. So what does that make you think? You guys have been around long enough. You've seen these cases, lawyers acting in the media. What do you think that indicates if he made this public? To me, it would indicate he thinks it's good for his clients and for his cases against his clients. Um, he thinks this is beneficial from them, for them. He thinks this is going to help their case or else he would have fought to keep it private, right? That's what happens. That's what we see in the Heard and Depp case. So, or, I mean, I guess the other explanation is getting out ahead of it, trying to make it seem like they're not scared of it. But I think usually if you're going to, if you're going to put this stuff out there, you think it's good for your case. Now, whether or not it is good, you all are going to tell me on today's live in the comments if you think this is beneficial at all for the Laundry family in their cases. So let's look at exactly what Stephen Bertolino said about releasing this to the public. And you can tell it's Stephen Bertolino from the top here. Today, the Petito family attorney, Patrick Riley, and myself met with the FBI in Tampa to sort through and take possession of the personal items that belong to Gabby and Brian. This was a previously agreed upon exchange to enable both the Petitos and the Laundries to receive or belong to their respective children. As part of this return of property and FBI custody, I was given Brian's notebook. I would like to share with the public the note that the FBI alluded to when they said on January 21st, 2022, that Brian claimed responsibility for the death of Gabby Petito. Although I have chosen to release this letter as a matter of transparency, I will not be commenting on it further as there are still proceedings pending in court. These are Brian's words. Okay, so there's no doubt that Bertolino put it out there. Let's find out what it says. It's pretty brutally sad. I'm going to try to whoop, zoom in here and get as much on one page so you guys can see it with me. And I'm going to do my best reading it. As you can see, it is not the easiest thing in the world to read. So don't come at me if you disagree with what a word says. Um, Gabby, I wish I was right at your side. I wish I could be talking to you right now. I'd be going through every morning, every memory we made getting even more excited for the future. But we lost our future and this and life without you. I've lost every day we could have spent together. Every holiday, I'll never get to play with something again. I'll never go hiking with TJ. I loved you more than anything. I can't begin to look at our photos to recall great times because it is why I cannot go on. When I chose, when I close my eyes, I will think of laughing on the roof of the van, falling asleep to the sight of a something at the crystal geyser. I will always love you. That's page one. If you are reading Gab's journal, looking at photos from our life, together flipping through old cards, you wouldn't want to live a day without her. Knowing that every day you'll wake up without her, you would want to wake up. You wouldn't want to wake up. I'm sorry to everyone this will affect. Gabby was the love of my life, but I know something for many. I'm so very sorry to her family because I love them. I consider her younger siblings my best of friends. I am sorry to my family. This is a shock to them as well. 
a terrible grief. I, I don't know what this word says, something like terrible grief. So it is a shock to his family as well. Very important, obviously, to their case. They loved her so much, if not more than me. Or they said they loved something so much, if not more than me. A new daughter to my mother, an aunt to my nephew. Please do not make this harder for them. This occurred as an unexpected tragedy. Rushing back to our car, trying to cross the stream of something before it got too dark to see too cold. I hear a splash <clears throat> and a scream. I could hardly see. I couldn't find her for a moment. Scree shouted her name. I found her breathing heavily, gasping, and she was freezing cold and bleeding hot national parks, the blazing hot national parks in Utah. The temperatures had dropped to freezing and she was soaking wet. I carried her as far as I could down the stream towards the car, stumbling, exerted, exhausted, in shock when my knees buckled. And no, I could, couldn't could safely carry her. I started a fire and spooned her as close to the heat. She was so thin, had been freezing for too long. I could at the time realize that I shouldn't start a fire, that I should start a fire first, but I wanted her out of the cold, back to the car from where I started the fire. I had no idea how far the car might be. Only knew it was across the creek. When I pulled Gabby out of the water, she called to me, I'm sorry, she couldn't tell me what hurt. She had a small bump on her forehead that eventually got large. Her feet hurt, her wrist hurt, but she was freezing, shaking violently while carrying her continually made sounds of pain Laying next to her, she said little, lapsing between violent shakes, gasping in pain, begging for an end to her pain. She would fall asleep and I would shake her awake, fearing she shouldn't close her eyes if she had a concussion. She would wake in pain, start her whole painful crying again when something that I was the one waking her, she wouldn't let me try to cross the creek. She thought like me that the car, that the fire would go out on her sleep and she'd freeze. I don't know the extent of Gabby's injuries, only that she was in extreme pain. I ended her life. I thought it was merciful and it's what she wanted, but I see now all the mistakes I made. So here's him taking responsibility for her death. I ended her life. I thought it was merciful. That is what she wanted, but I see now all the mistakes I made. I panicked. I was in shock. I was in shock, but from the moment I decided I took away her pain. I knew I couldn't go on without her. I rushed home to spend any time I had left with my family. I wanted to drive north and let James or TJ kill me, but I wouldn't want them to spend time in jail over my mistake, even though I'm sure they would have liked to. I am ending my life, not because of a fear of punishment, but rather because I can't 
stand to live another day without her. I've lost our our whole future together. Every moment we could have established, I'm sorry for everyone's loss. Please do not make life harder for my family. Again, affecting these cases, they have lost a son and a daughter that meant or the most wonderful girl in the world. Gabby is something. I have killed myself by this creek in the hopes that animals would tear me apart, may tear me apart, that it may make some of her family happy. Please pick up all of my things. Gabby hated people who litter. And that's the end of the journal. So it is brutal, right? It was pretty brutal um, to listen to and to read. Hold on one second. All right. So what does this mean? What do we learn from the journal? How is it going to affect the cases, right? That's what we're here to break down. Is it true? We don't know. Is it authentic? We don't know. That will probably be um, brought to light as the trial goes on. But the first question that we have around this is, would there have been criminal charges based on this? Because he basically is saying he helped her kill herself to end her pain because that's what she wanted. Well, the answer is likely yes. Can't Dr. Kevorkian style help somebody commit suicide? There would be some kind of homicide charge if he was still alive. Jury could have felt bad for him, could have been jury nullification, things like that, but a charge definitely could have come. And that's important because that brings into play the Fifth Amendment right of his parents and their implication, right? So how does it affect their case? To me, and my question to you at the beginning was, do you think this is more beneficial to Gabby's family in the case or to Brian Laundrie's family in the, in the case. And to me, it's more beneficial to Brian Laundrie's parents because he's saying they don't know about it, right? Um, and it makes it even more difficult, I think, for Gabby Petito's family because it does bring at least some sympathy to Brian Laundrie and his family. He doesn't implicate them in anything that he's saying. Um, he says it was unexpected. They didn't know about it. It doesn't seem like they were helping him leave the country. It seemed like he planned on ending his life, which is what he said. And that's exactly what he did. He ended his life in that spot and animals, I think, did pick apart his body or tear apart his body, like he said. So all of that kind of lines up in the journal to me. Um, and I think I see some people saying that's not what the autopsy said. I remember the autopsy saying there was a lot of different um, injuries to her head, blunt force trauma injuries to her wrist, but that she died of asphy asphyxiation, which is how they knew it was, or they thought it was an intentional homicide. And this lines up with that story, right? And the autopsy came out theoretically after he wrote this journal entry. So if it does line up, the timing of the journal entry seems to authenticate it. Now, if the laundry parents found this and wrote this all out to try to, you know, cover their behinds or something, obviously if that comes out, then, you know, we get that. But assuming that this happened in the time frame that, the FBI, and it seems like law enforcement believes it happened. It seems to, to line up pretty decently, I think, with the autopsy, from what I remember of the autopsy. Um, next question, will this affect the judge's ruling on the motion to dismiss? The answer to that is a very firm no. This evidence should have absolutely no effect on whether or not this case should continue. Um, and frankly, the judge could look at it. He may see it, but it's not going to affect his ruling at all. The next question is, will this come out in discovery if the case is not dismissed? And the answer to that is yes, it will come out in discovery. Um, it will be something that is discoverable in the case, especially now that it's public because it is relevant evidence. If they can prove it's authentic, then it can come out in this case. Will it come out in trial? On the other hand, is whether or not they can get over hearsay with exceptions to hearsay with a deceased declarant because there are going to be hearsay issues. So we'll see how that argument comes out in court. But what is this likely to prove or disprove? It could prove what the laundry's knowledge was. It could prove that there was no intent because this is intentional infliction of emotional distress. And to me, this shows that there was no intent on Brian. La I mean, 
you can disagree with this, right? You can say he, he, he shouldn't have done all this. He did it on purpose to hurt Gabby or to hurt her family. But if what he's saying at this point is true, he had no intent to hurt Gabby's family. The laundry family had no intent to hurt Gabby's family. They did not intend to cause them more, more distress. He was intending to help Gabby, at least in his point of view, as much as we all may disagree with that. But I think it may show or at least be evidence that tends to prove that the laundry family as a whole did not want to hurt Gabby and intentionally inflict emotional distress on Gabby and on her family. So I think this would potentially tend to prove that. This could also potentially affect the wrongful death case that we haven't talked a lot about. So it doesn't seem like it will actually affect it in real life because it doesn't seem like there's going to be put a big defense on it by the estate of Brian Laundrie. But if they did put on a big defense, an argument that they would make in defense of Brian Laundrie is that Gabby Petito's life was, they could argue from this, that she had serious injuries and maybe used the medical examiner to say, maybe she was going to pass away regardless of what Brian Laundrie did. Right. And could that affect the value of the case? These are arguments defense attorneys make in injury cases like this. So I think this could be potential evidence they use in that case. Now, whether it would change the fact that he is responsible for ending her life, I don't think it would change that, but it could come into play where how severe were her injuries before he made the mistake he references in his journal. So it could be evidence in that case as well, potentially. I see a lot of people saying he meant to hurt her. He didn't write it. Um, I, I understand that. I, I agree he did hurt her family. Nobody is saying he didn't hurt her family. Um, what was the intent to hurt her family? I don't know. People said he can write whatever. I need facts. That's fair. Um, where does it say his family didn't know? Uh, multiple times he said... It came as a surprise to his family. This was unexpected. Now, it doesn't say they didn't know he didn't do it after the fact. Um, but now we will get to some of the questions and comments here. And we'll answer your questions. I'll do my best. I'm just telling you what how I think lawyers are going to use this, right? Not, not what I think it proves or anything like that. Um, Bobby Cat says, taking your life as a permanent solution to a temporary or for a temporary problem. It's, it's never a good thing. Uh, zigzag. There's a typed format. Yeah, I know, but somebody else is interpreting it to type it to that, right? So I just, I'm always nervous about reading somebody else's type format. Now, if it was evidence that everybody agreed on and they typed it out, what the transcript of this notebook was, then yes, we would read that at that point. Uh, Nicholas Starro. Weird that Laundry's lawyer did that. Even if it helps them, it's a weird decision. I agree. Opens too many doors. It's very weird. But maybe he knew it was coming out anyways and he wanted to get ahead of it. Lisa, fine. Let's say it's true. Why did he leave her body? Lots of unanswered questions. And whether or not his story is even true, right? You're saying, let's say it's true. We don't know it's true. It could be false. But this is the only story we have right now. And can they prove it's false? Something like that. Um... What were her injuries in the autopsy report? Jilly's Joy said, I did a whole video on it. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I remember blunt force trauma to the head, injuries to other parts of her body like her wrist, but those were not the injuries that killed her. It was the asphyxiation. Now we know that it was Brian Laundrie that did that part. That was actually the cause of her death. So that's what I remember from the autopsy. I went through it in detail. If you want to check out our Petito playlist on YouTube, you can check out the video we did breaking down the entire autopsy. So Don Noel, if she was hurt by an accident, why didn't he ask for help? Why not tell her family? It doesn't make sense to me. Unfortunately, I will tell you, accidental killings result in suicides a lot. People feel guilt. They feel grief. They feel in shock. They like all of the things he was explaining here. And then they end their life, which is never a good decision. And, you know, so just to say that he didn't, come for help doesn't mean it wasn't an accident. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know the answer, right? I don't know the answer. I think he should have called for help. I think he should have done everything he could to try to get law enforcement out there or get before ending her life. You would think it would be logical to run to the car, 
get his phone, get to a phone, call, and at least try to get somebody out there to help her. But it seems like he was thinking ending her pain right there was a better thing to do, which to me makes no sense at all. I am not, that is not where my brain ever goes. That is not how I think. I don't think ending someone's life is ever a good decision, right? But that doesn't mean that's not what he was thinking in the moment, right? I disagree with it. I never would have done it. I think if he was still alive, he should be prosecuted criminal for what criminally for what he did. Um, absolutely. All of that. All of that. But I do think this is a more sympathetic story than kind of what I was thinking before, which, and I'm not saying this is true again, but if this is true, it's definitely a more sympathetic story to him than we saw that they got in a domestic altercation. Maybe he got mad at her again and he ended it and then he escaped and then he was guilty and he ended his life. That's kind of what I thought played out, right? I don't know if any of you agree or disagree. That's kind of how I thought it played out. So this at least gives a different story to that. Should a lawyer play out the case in the media? This case is getting played out in the media, whether the lawyer wants to or not, but Bertolino has been way out in front of it in the media. Uh, Audrey said he could have called 911. I think he should have. He said they were far away from their car. He didn't know how to get back to their car, which again, I'm not that type of guy, right? I don't go on camping trips where I don't know where my car is or where I am that far away from civilization. I'm not that kind of guy. So it's hard for me to understand, but it seems like they had kind of gone out into the national park and didn't know where they were. Natasha Gale. Is the reason why the parents aren't considered to be withholding or obstructing of justice because the police hadn't officially said Brian was a suspect, just a person of interest and had a lawyer? No, it's also because they pled the fifth. So they don't have to talk to law enforcement. They don't have to engage in this um, investigation if they, they do have the right to remain silent, which again, because of all of this, I think they had a reasonable um, thought to remain silent. I do think they had a reasonable thought and belief to that. David Mac nine. I'm hung up on why he changed pens for the last sentence. There are no signs. The first ran out. I think he wrote the last sentence rest was added by the family, but there won't be any justice here. Sadly. Wow. That's so that's an interesting take. Let me pull up that last sentence again. It does look different, but it looks like it may be enhanced as opposed to different friend. I mean, different pen. Um, but I'm not sure. Uh, Diana Marie Centro. Thank you, new member. Nicholas Stero. With all the pics and videos they did on their hikes. Why would both of them leave their phones behind on hikes? Sus, 1,000% agree with you. I think that's a great point. Great point. Now, some could probably argue maybe they don't have service, but they could still take videos. I don't know. But yeah, run to wherever you have service. This is why I don't go places where it's so far out there where something like this could even happen. Um, Would be really hard to fake his handwriting for so many pages. True. Uh, Lori Sue, bottom line, regardless of the efficacy of bringing the lawsuit against the laundries, the court of public perception seems more imperative to the Petitos as it relates to moving on hard to know. I agree with you there. Zigzag saying we don't know it's his writing. That's correct. My guess is we could get some kind of writing experts, so to other things he wrote. Oh, 911 works where you don't have service a lot of times. That's true, Vicky said. Yeah, there's some comments about didn't he move her body to a different spot too? It seems like he said this happened in Utah and I think her body was found in Wyoming. I'm not positive on those details, so I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to talk too much because I'm not positive, but it seems like maybe, yeah, the body was in a different space, place, which doesn't make any sense. Could somebody else have moved the body? I, I don't know. It just seems weird. Yeah, Joe, this is my, this is exactly how I feel right now. This is such a strange, strange story. Um, very interesting. Yeah, and a lot of people saying they don't believe this story. So that's Brian Laundrie's notebook. Um, I want to pop on here real quick and talk about it. It is a really sad story. We're going to continue following it. There's a lot of interest. Like this video if you haven't already, if you're interested in this. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We'll be doing more stuff on there, at Tragos Laws, our handle on there. 
Um, comment what you think. Comment who you think this is helping. Comment if this is something that you find to be believable, this story, or if not, why. Um, very weird story. But I appreciate you guys all jumping on here. As always, it was fun, um, as fun as this story could be. I guess not really. This wasn't really that fun, but it was interesting. This is very weird. I felt very weird reading it for the first time, but discussing with you guys is always interesting. So I appreciate you all joining me on here. Have a great weekend. This is for real the last live for today.